Hello everybody, this is Tim here again, here with my review for Scream 2. Uh, just to jump into this movie, uh, the last time I watched these movies was in a big Scream marathon, basically all four in a row, and I really hated the sequels last time I watched them. But watching them now, I had more realistic expectations, and going into them, I thought of them as sequels, which they are, obviously, but I knew they weren't going to be as good as the first film, so I watched them with more realistic expectations, and didn't judge them as harshly as I did before. Judge them more on like a normal basis that I judge. I judge movies as all the. I mean, usually. <sighs> so just to jump into Scream Two here, just to give the rating for it, I would give it three and a half stars out of four. It's a pretty good movie. It's not great, but it's pretty good. Um, just to jump into the movie, it uh, it's a basic sequel setup. It takes place uh, as well as Scream One's a parody of horror films. This film is a parody of horror movie sequels. Um, one thing about this movie is they don't really lay down the rules of like horror movie sequels like too good in this one. Like they lay down the rules of horror movies in the first one, um, and in this one they kind of like bring them up, but they don't really do much with them. Um, you got pretty much the well, you got the whole cast back pretty much from the last movie, all, well the survivors anyway. Um, Sydney is going to college. Uh, Jamie Kennedy is at college. There, well Jamie Kennedy's character is Randy. But uh, I just call him Jamie Kennedy because that's, that's all he'll ever be to me is Jamie Kennedy. But uh, he goes to college as well. Uh, you got Gail Weathers coming back, um, or Courtney Cox, I mean, and David R. Kent. One thing I love in this movie is that Gail Weathers has like, wrote a book uh, ba uh, based off the last murders or about the last murders, I mean, from the first movie. And uh, David R. Kent like, hates the book because it just keeps putting him down to the book in the book his character is like put down all the time and i love when he's like he's like quoting lines from the book and he's like um deputy dewey uh um oozes inexperience and then he's talking to courtney cox and he goes if you'll excuse me i have some oozing to do i lo i love that i thought that was funny as shit that was funny as hell i love that um David R. Kent and Courtney Cox are broke up in this movie, so I guess since the last movie they got together but then broke up, or or they never really got together. I'm not for sure, but they're not together in this movie. <laughs> they still have the same chemistry they had last time, still good chemistry. Courtney Cox looks hot in this movie. The last movie she looked good, uh, and uh, in this movie she looks hot. I know in part three she looks like shit, so just to put that out there before we get into it, in part three she looks like shit, but in this movie she looks hot. Um, so, Sydney pretty much has a new set of friends, she's got a new boyfriend, Jerry, o Jerry O'Connell, the dude from Joe's Apartment, I always remember him as the guy from Joe's Apartment, which I really loved him in Joe's Apartment, because I actually really like Joe's Apartment, some people hate that movie, but fuck it, I like Joe's Apartment, I'm a sucker for it, I, I can't help it, but anyway, so, uh, you get an opening kill, like the last movie had an opening kill with Drew Barrymore, and this one you got... Jada Pinkett Smith, and I think the other actor's name might be Omar Epps, I'm not for sure, that might be who it is, but they get killed at a movie theater where they've like, uh, Hollywood has made a movie based off the murders from the first film, so it's kind of like a movie within a movie thing, which I thought was pretty cool, and it's got like Heather Graham playing Drew Barrymore's part in the movie, but anyway, they're in the theater watching the movie, Omar Epps, I believe is the actor's name now, don't quote me on that, he goes to the bathroom, and he gets like, the killer's like in the next stall next to him, and he fucking takes the, the knife and rams it straight through the side of the bathroom stall into Omar Epps's head. That's like a badass death, but at the same time I'm thinking, man, that killer must be one strong motherfucker, because it would have took a lot of force to like drive a knife through like a, look like it was made out of marble or something like that, through a bathroom stall. I'm not sure what it was made out of, but even if it was some steel or metal, I mean, fuck. That would have took a lot of effort. Um, Omar Epps is dead, and Jada Pinkett Smith gets stabbed to death in the theater while they're watching the movie. Which is a pretty epic death. Uh, this death, this opening kill is n almost as good as the first one. It's more theatrical than the first one from the first movie. But it's not quite as good. It lacks it lacks a little bit of the terror. And just like the, and the originality of the first movie. Because it was the first movie. It lacks a little bit of that. But still really epic. And he's like stabbing uh, Jada Pinkett Smith to death. and But nobody in the audience said... Uh, notices because they think it's a publicity stunt she goes up on like the, the stage of the theater and she like falls down dead like right in front of the movie screen it's like really epic and then it pops up it's like scream two and i'm like that's badass badass uh <laughs> but yeah we got basically a new cast of characters not really much the cast in this one with sydney's friends are all weaker 
than the cast from the first movie. She has a friend in this movie. I'm not even sure the, the actress's name, but she has like a... I don't know who the girl is, who the actor's name is. I don't even remember the character's name because she was so pretty much useless to the plot. Jerry O'Connell, he's alright, but I like Jerry O'Connell. But his acting is nothing to write home about in this movie. Jamie Kennedy's pretty much the same character from the last one. He's still lovable and likable and very charming to see and enjoyable. You get Timothy o Olympiant, or Olympiant, or however you say his last name. Oliphant, I think that's how you say it. The guy from Hitman and Die Hard 4. Um, he's fine, but he really doesn't do anything. Once again, his character disappears like half the movie. <laughs> you even get Laura Metcalf, like the girl from Play Jackie on Roseanne. You get her here playing a reporter. Um, and like I said, you get Courtney Cox back, and she's uh, at the college. You know, obviously wanting to talk to Sydney. Sydney hits her again. And so it's kind of like a repeat of the same shit from the last movie. And it's like, eh, do you have anything new here? But, um, oh, you also get, um, Sarah Michelle Gellar, who looks pretty hot in this movie. But she doesn't really do anything. And she she gets killed in, um, in her dorm, her college dorm. She gets thrown off the top of the balcony. I split her brains out, uh, <laughs> on the, the concrete floor or whatever. Or on the, the floor. After she's been stabbed like five or six times. So she gets pretty decent death. But, uh, once again, she's in the movie for so little, it's just like, feels just like a thrown in there death. I mean, you don't really care that she's dead, to be honest. I mean, she's hot, but hotness, you know, there's more to, like, caring about somebody than hotness, obviously. She didn't get naked, so who cares? <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, one thing I find funny is that Jamie Kennedy keeps arguing with Timothy Oliphant about uh, originals being better than sequels. I thought that was kind of neat. And Timothy Oliphant keeps naming off James Cameron sequels like Aliens and Terminator 2. That's kind of funny, which I, I, I do think the first Alien is better than the second Alien, but I think the second Alien is really close. I do think Terminator 2, though, is better, uh, is better than Terminator 1. But I just found that funny that they were arguing about that. And uh, Sarah Michelle Gellar is like talking to Timothy Oliphant, and she's like, you, you have a hard on for James Cameron. <laughs> I thought that was funny. But um, you got like uh, Sydney's at the college, and she starts getting the phone calls again. You know, the killer's fucking with her. He takes off chasing after her. Jerry O'Connell gets his arm cut, but of course it misses any vital arteries, so automatically Dewey assumes that he's the killer. Um, which I, which you know he's not going to be because it would just be a repeat of the first film and there's no way they would do that because that would just seem lazy. One thing I do find funny is that, uh, uh David Arkant, Dewey, and, uh, Randy, uh, Jamie Kennedy are, like, spitballing about who the killer might be. And I find it funny and, uh, because, uh, David Arkant's like, um, uh, uh, maybe you are a suspect, Randy. And Randy's like, well, if I'm a suspect, then you're a suspect. And, uh, David Arkant goes, you have a point. Let's move on from this conversation. <laughs> I love that. I thought that was funny. There's still some humorous lines in here. The humor is still pretty funny. It's not as good as the first movie, um, but it's still pretty funny. Still enjoyable. Uh, one thing in this movie is that Jamie Kennedy's character gets killed. He gets pulled into a van, like a news van that was Courtney Cox's van, and he gets stabbed to death in the van. It's a pretty gruesome death. Not really super bloody, but gruesome, though intense. And, like, there's these guys walking by coincidentally at the same time with a stereo boombox blasting full blast. And I'm like, okay, what the fuck's the odds of that? But anyway, he gets stabbed to death. So he's like the mo he's like the fan favorite character, really. I mean, even to me, he's the he's my favorite character of the franchise. So he gets stabbed to death and he gets killed. And I'm like, well, if they're willing to kill him, this movie's showing that it's got some balls. So let's see if it can continue this. And so pretty much later on in the movie... Um, Jerry O'Connell, uh, him and Sydney, they start, uh, Sydney starts wanting to break up with him because she doesn't trust him too much, and he does, like, this big dance routine from Top Gun in, like, the, the, the college lunchroom or whatever, which is kind of cute, um, makes me like Jerry O'Connell's character a little bit more, even though his acting, once again, is not that great, but it makes me like him a little bit more, it shows he's got a, a sweet side to him, and plus, Jerry O'Connell, is he's likable, at least in my opinion. I believe he was on Sliders as well, and I liked him on Sliders as well, but he's a likable guy. But, yeah, of course we, the audience, know, though, it's not him. That'd just be way too fucking obvious. Um, and so, after Randy's dead, um, Dewey and Gail, they, like, go to the, 
they go to the auditorium at the college. They want to look at this footage that she had on camera to see if the killer was filming them as well because they suspect the killer has been watching their every move. And so they start uh, going through the footage and they start getting romantic again because you know they're going to get back together, obviously, or they still care about each other. They don't really get back together, but you can see the seeds of it getting planted or whatever in their relationship, I mean, which is fine. I mean, it's fine. Um, but uh, the killer shows up, and there's like this soundproof glass, and Dewey's on one side, and Courtney Cox is on the other. He like stabs Dewey in the back. The killer does and puts his face right up against it, but he can't make any noise or anything because it's like soundproof. He's playing like this epic music, and he slides down like the glass with blood coming out of his mouth. It's a really epic, like death scene, and it should should have been a death scene, but I'll get to that later. Um, so Courtney Cox manages to get away from the killer because he can't break into the room that she's in. So Dewey is pretty much dead, but he doesn't get Courtney Cox. Um, they uh, Jerry O'Connell's like college friends tie him up because he gave like his fraternity necklace to. Nev Campbell, Sydney, or whatever her character. And so they like tie him up and throw some kind of party or something like that because he did it. And they're like pouring beer down his underwear or whatever. And I'm like, okay, well, whatever. I guess this is how it, it rolls in college, I guess. I guess it's how these college boys roll. But anyway. And uh, pretty much the police want to take Sydney and her friend to a safe location. Of course, ghost face attacks. Oh, one thing is that. I said, in the last review of the first movie, I said the fans call him Ghostface, but actually Wes Craven calls him Ghostface as well. So I guess he came up with the name, and the fans just, well, just used it from there, because that's the character's name. But yeah, I should have stated that in the last video, but I didn't know that at the time, or, or if I did, I forgot that Wes Craven actually named the character Ghostface. Well, either him or Kevin Williamson, but the fact is that everybody calls him Ghostface, including the creators. So that is his, his name. It's not just a fan thing. But anyway... So they're getting ready to leave. Ghostface attacks the police uh, while they're driving on the road. They stop for a red light. He attacks them. Fucking busts his fist through one of the windows and like cuts one dude's throat. Grabs the other guy out of the vehicle and starts banging his head against the door. Slings him down. And then jumps in the vehicle. And the dude jumps on top of the hood. The other cop does. That he was The one that was getting his head banged against the door. He jumps on top of the fucking hood and is like... Get out of there, motherfucker, I'm going to blow your head off. And Ghostface, like, fucking floors it and drives him into, like, a big pipe. It goes straight through the dude's head and through the car window. It's, like, pretty, that's a pretty badass, that's a pretty badass scene. Um, so they got to get the fuck out of there. Nev Campbell and her friend are caught in the back seat. And, like, uh, they got to get out of the police car, but they got to crawl past the killer, Ghostface, who's knocked out, and through the window of the vehicle to get out of there. Uh, which it's, this is one. This is the most intense scene in the movie. This is the best played, uh, tense scene in the movie. Really, the only tense scene in the movie. This is the best played scene in the whole movie. Uh, and pretty much one of my favorites, if not my, if not my top favorite scene in the movie. Well, other than Dewey stabbing, probably. But uh, they managed to make it out of there. But of course, Sydney wants to go back and see who the frig this guy is. Um, and she starts to go back, and it's predictable that Ghostface isn't there anymore, and he jumps out and stabs Sydney's friend, kills her, kills Sydney's friend, which was predictable. Sydney gets away and makes it back to the school. Um, there's like this play thing that Sydney's doing in the movie, some kind of Joan of Arc thing, or, or Helen of Troy thing, or something like that, some kind of stage play, which is kind of neat. Uh, one thing, though, another scene earlier in the movie that I hated was when she's doing, like, the play or whatever. And Ghostface is like on stage dressed up as one of the, the actors or characters or whatever in the play. And he's like fucking with her. And then he like disappears and just disappears off stage. And I'm I'm like, where the fuck did he go? How can nobody see him running off stage? How can none of the other people on stage notice this dude? Or was it just all in her imagination? I'm not for sure about that. That's a little iffy. That seems a little, eh, you know, one of those eh, what the fuck scenes. A lot of movies have those. Um. But, uh, oh, you also get Leif Schreiber coming back as Cotton Weary, pretty much uh, a slightly more extended role. He keeps fucking with Sydney, wanting her to do an interview with Diane Sawyer. Uh, <laughs> I find that funny. He, like, wants to embrace his fame and make money off his situation or whatever, unlike Sydney, who just doesn't want anything to do with it. But he wants to make money off the situation and everything and get his due and make as much cash as he can. I found that funny. The movie tries to make you think he's the killer, but once again, that's just too obvious. There's no way it's going to be him. But, um, Sydney manages to get away. She makes it back to where the play was at or whatever. She's on the stage. 
that's when uh, she finds Derek there. The character's name is Derek that Jerry O'Connell plays. He's like strung up there, almost like a crucifixion type pose, but it's not. I don't. I mean, it's almost like a crucifixion thing, but it's it's not. But he's like strung up there on stage, and uh, the killer takes off his mask and come to find out it's Timothy Oliphant who disappeared for over half the movie. And I'm like, no friggin' shit, it's him. He disappeared for the whole friggin' movie. How could you not know it was him? He's the obvious fucking suspect. He's so obvious that after Derek got cut in the movie, Jerry O'Connell's character, uh, which the knife blade missed all his vital ar arteries, um, Mickey is Timothy Oliphant's character's name. He's sitting there talking to Sydney, and he's like, why would anybody go back in that house? I'm talking about Jerry O'Connell for going back in the house to try to stop the killer from getting away, and I'm like, gee, this guy it seems like he's trying to push the blame on somebody there. It's obviously this jackass, but anyway... <laughs> They must think the audience is, like, fucking retarded not to figure that one out. It's obviously him. It was obviously him. Of course, he has a partner. In comes Lori Metcalf, uh, who poses a character, Debbie Salt, but she's actually Mrs. Loomis, and it's like, how the fuck could we have known that she was the killer? She was hardly in the movie Lori Metcalf was. I mean, she was in the movie, but she was, like, not even a secondary character. I mean, she was like a low-level secondary character in the movie. She was like barely in the movie Hardwick. There's no way to fucking guess it was her Hardwick. I mean, there's like almost no way to guess it was her. And she's just... And she's just so hardly in the movie. That just seems like a cheat. She's not really in the movie enough for her to even be a suspect, almost. It's like, surprise, it's the person that was hardly in the movie that you never could have suspected anyway because we didn't give you any reason to fucking suspect them. But anyway, but I do like that you find out that she is uh, that she's Billy Loomis's mom. I thought that was cool. I like that. Gave it like a Mrs. Voorhees type thing, like Jason style. I enjoyed that. Of course, she shoots down Mickey, so Timothy Oliphant is dead, or so you think. She shoots him down. One thing I find funny is that Timothy Oliphant wanted to actually get caught and have a trial and everything, and he wanted to like blame. Um, the murders on the movies, horror movies and shit like that. I thought that was funny. Oh, he shot Jerry O'Connell, by the way, and killed him off. Which, that kind of made me feel sad. I kind of felt bad for that character. Because he was innocent and Sidney thought he was guilty. Or started to suspect he might have been. Which made me feel so more sorry for him when he got gunned down by jackass Timothy Oliphant. But, uh, I think Timothy Oliphant's dead. So, Sidney and, um... And uh, Debbie Salt, or Mrs. Loomis, I mean, have a knife fight. She, they have a, a chick fight, which is pretty cool. Um, Sydney's got like a Lin Lindell Hamilton thing going, like uh, Timothy Oliphant's character puts it. Um, but it's a pretty cool little ending fight scene here. Um, she wants to, uh, she blames, well, she wants to kill Nev Campbell's character because Nev Campbell killed her son, obviously. She's trying to take her out with a knife, trying to stab her guts out. Uh, she manages to actually get Neff Campbell, but um, Lee Schreiber shows up. His Cotton Weary shows up, his character. Uh, he's got a gun, and it's funny because they're like actually, all three of them's like negotiating. Uh, well, the other two of them are negotiating the Cotton, uh, which one he should kill. And uh, I find this hilarious that uh, Sydney agrees to do the Diane Sawyer interview. And he and because she said that, he, sh he shoots Billy Loomis's mom. Shoots Mrs. Loomis down and kills her. I found that hilarious. You now, when I another thing I love is that Sydney's character gets uh, really tough at the end of this movie, and um, like Mickey Timothy Oliphant's character is like bragging about Billy Loomis or whatever. And she's got like uh, <clears throat> this necklace in her hand that uh, Jerry O'Connell gave her, and she's like, uh, "You forgot one thing about Billy Loomis." And he goes, "What?" And she goes, "I fucking killed him." And she takes the necklace. And fucking like swaps the side of Timothy Oliphant's face. I thought that was cool. Showed that she was badass. I like that. Um, another thing I find funny here is that uh, Timothy Oliphant, like, you think uh, Mrs. Loomis is going to jump up for one last scare, but it's Timothy Oliphant instead, and he like leaps up behind behind them, and they turn around and fucking gun him down. Courtney Cox and, uh, <laughs> and Nev Campbell do. I thought that was great. Um... Courtney Cox got shot by Mrs. Loomis. I forgot to mention that. She walked in. Uh, Mrs. Loomis brought her in with her, I mean, when she showed up. And she shot. Well, no, it didn't get shot by Mrs. Loomis. She, she got shot down by Mickey, who was dying and still had his gun in his hand. And it went off. And uh, 
tr I'm getting fucking mind boggled here. When Mrs. Loomis showed up, she shot down Mickey. When Mrs. Loomis showed up, she had Courtney Cox with her, Gail Weathers. She sh Mrs. Loomis shot down Mickey, and he had a gun in his hand, and he shot Courtney Cox's character, Gail Weathers, and Gail got shot, but she's not dead, and so she's got a gun now, and her and Nev Campbell fucking gunned down Mickey, who you thought was dead, but he jumps up for one last surprise, which I like that, because you think it's going to be Mrs. Loomis, but it's actually, you know, Mickey, which I like that. And so they gun his fucking ass down, and then Nev Campbell turns around, looks down there, and uh, Mrs. Loomis fucking shoots her in the head and goes, just in case. It's like, double tap, baby. Yeah! I love that. That was great. But anyway, they start leaving, and um, Dewey is still alive after getting knifed in the back, like, really painfully. How the fuck is he still alive? What is up with that? Once again, he was supposed to die. I know it has to be true. He was supposed to die. But Wes Craven said, we killed off Jamie and Kennedy, and fans might not forgive us if we killed off another character. That really hurt this sequel. Dewey should have died in this movie. That would have really gave this sequel the lift it needed to almost completely, to almost match the first film. That would have really gave this sequel more balls. But instead, it neuters it almost. He should not be alive. He should. But it's a fucking cheat. He's like indestructible. <laughs> That's bullshit. He should have been dead. That's total bullshit that he survived. But another thing I do like though is that uh they're interviewing Sydney, all the reporters are. They're like, What's it like to be a survivor again and all that shit? And she goes, Talk to Cotton Weary, he's the real hero and all the reporters go over there to leave Schreiber and he's got like a big, you know, smile on his face and everything and he's really happy, you know, finally get his time in the limelight and all that shit. Which I thought that was cool that Sydney did that for him. That was cool. And then pretty much after that, the movie ends. Presto, you're done. I mean, that's just that's it. It pretty much ends there with Sydney alone, losing her boyfriend again, who she well losing a boyfriend again. This time, one that she loves. So it's kind of a little sad because it just leaves with her by herself and on her own with all her friends dead. I mean, except for Dewey and Gale, but still, I mean, shit. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of sad, but still, at the same time, I'd give this movie three and a half stars. It's pretty good. It's not great. It's not as good as the first movie. The first movie I'd put on, put on the level of greatness, on great for a horror movie. This movie's just pretty good for a horror movie. Pretty much a standard sequel setup, obviously, but not, not anything amazing or mind-blowing. You get some cool deaths, though, like the opening kill in the movie theater, and, of course, Randy's surprise death, but... The Dewey surviving just weakens the movie. It does. It weakens it. Not completely, but it, it weakens it. Uh, Billy Loomis's mom being the killer, that's kind of cool. But yeah, all in all, it's a pretty good movie. Don't get me wrong. It's pretty good. It's enjoyable. I'm glad to watch it, and I own it, and I'm happy owning it. It's an enjoyable sequel. A much better sequel than you would normally get for movies in general. Um, definitely one to watch. If you like the first movie, I'd say check it out. It's worth watching. It is enjoyable. The cast in this movie of Sydney's Friends, though, just aren't as good as the ones from the first film. But it is enjoyable. Um, and definitely a movie to see. It's not a bad sequel. Like I said, it's a pretty good sequel. Uh, but just not great like the first one. But definitely pretty good. And much better than average, or much better than you would ever usually get for a sequel. Um, Especially to a movie that was really good, like the first one. But once, but yeah, but like I said, not anything mind blowing. But yeah, all in all, this is a three and a half star film, pretty good movie, and I'll see you guys again with Scream Three.